All right, what's happening everybody? This is Dave with AD Aquascaping, and today we're gonna to be talking about how you can optimize uh, the CO2 within your aquarium. So this is going to be applying to people who are running a high-tech aquarium, obviously. So I'm gonna go over uh, some quick basics on how you can optimize your CO2, and then I'm gonna talk about a couple more ideas uh, that relate to you know, the biofilm that we get on the surface of our aquariums, and how that relates to the CO2 and oxygen exchange rate and how it relates to the overall uh, distribution of CO2. And then I'm going to talk a little bit um, more about how um, your CO2 levels and light, you know, the relationship between CO2 and light and how they can interact with uh, plant growth and how you can balance different types of species of plants within an aquarium, you know, depending on their height in the aquarium in your setup just to give you some more ideas those two aspects of optimizing your co2 are things that um, are often overlooked a lot of people don't talk about them and we hear things about the co2 o2 flux and how you need surface agitation but it's not really fully explained so I hope I'm gonna be able to explain that for you today so real quick let's just go over two simple ways that you can optimize your co2 that a lot of us have heard about first off of course is you can have your CO2 come on two hours before your lights come on, just so that the CO2 is at a good, you know, high saturation level once the lights do come on. And then you can have your CO2 turn off an hour before the lights go off, just because at that point you're at full saturation um, of CO2 within your setup. You don't really need to have the CO2 run until the lights turn off. So that just helps, you know, your system obviously become more optimized and helps save on money, everything like that. So have it come on two hours before the lights come on have the CO2 turn off an hour before the lights go off. Um, another thing that you can do, instead of using an in-tank diffuser, if you hate the Sprite water, you can use a reactor or an inline diffuser. Now there is some evidence to suggest that using an inline CO2 diffuser because it has dissolved CO2 and also um, the mist of CO2 bubbles is the best of both worlds and some evidence does suggest that you want both because having those bubbles in physical contact with the plants uh, can actually be an advantageous environment for the plants. If you absolutely hate the Sprite water, just use a reactor. Uh, my personal preference is an inline CO2 diffuser because they're simple, they're easy, they're inexpensive, there's less things in the tank as well when you use an inline diffuser or a reactor. And a lot of people just don't like that mist water that the in-tank diffuser creates. So again, those are just two simple tips. We've all heard about those before, um, but they do obviously help in optimizing your CO2. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the biofilm, that oil slick that we get on the top of our aquarium, which is actually, you know, it's a whole microbial colony. Um, it's not just protein, you know, bacteria are more than just protein. And we're gonna talk about how that biofilm that everyone hates, you know, how it relates to CO2, and oxygen and you know how it relates to the surface interface that we call the CO2 oxygen flux you know the exchange rate basically between those two gases at the water column interface we often hear that hey you want good surface agitation why because it helps stabilize CO2 why because it helps increase your oxygen well what are the reasons behind um, how it works and what, what do people mean by stable so of course, you're getting that biofilm on the top of your aquarium because it's actually a lack of oxygen. Um, it happens a lot with canister filters. If you have a wet dry filter or a fluidized bed filter, it's not going to happen as often. If you have cascading water going down into your tank, like oftentimes I have my water evaporate quite frequently, it'll get rid of that biofilm. Not just because it's breaking it up, because you're actually increasing your oxygen. You know, you should ask yourself, why is the biofilm growing there? Well, there's organics in the water column you know, little bits of colloidal particles. Well, why is it growing on the surface? Well, because that's in direct contact with, with a higher concentration of oxygen. So it's more beneficial for the bacteria to grow there. If you increase your overall oxygen in your aquarium, that biofilm will disappear. Now you can actually do this in different ways than surface agitation. If you have a wet dry filter, you're not gonna have that biofilm either. That's not necessarily surface agitation, but it's just, you know, the water percolating over the the biomedia. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, people will use the surface skimmers to get rid of it, which is a good idea. Um, people can increase their agitation. Like I said, you can have 
ridiculously high surface agitation with a canister filter, which is what I do, and I often experience evaporation uh, consistently, which also gets rid of that uh, by increasing the oxygen. Now, how does this relate to optimizing your CO2? Why do I want to get rid of that biofilm? Well, this biofilm can actually hinder the stability of the gas exchange between the oxygen and the CO2. It can reduce the amount of oxygen getting into the water, and it can actually reduce the amount of CO2 getting out of the water. Now you might want to say, well, why do I want the CO2 to get out of the water? Why do I want to have a high fluctuation of CO2 leaving the water? Well, this is it. This is the main point of everything that I just said. So pay attention to this one bit. When you increase the flux, so we're increasing the surface agitation, we're actually allowing more CO2 to escape. You know, it's consistently escaping regularly, which creates that stability. Well, when you're allowing more CO2 um, basically to gas off out of the water, this allows you to pump more CO2 into that space, into that volume. So think of your aquarium, think of the aquarium space that you have. When the flux increases, so you're getting more oxygen in, you're actually getting more CO2 out, right? You still have that there's going to reach an equilibrium of a certain level of CO2, whether it's 20 parts per million, 30 parts per million, or 40. Let's say you like your tank at 30 parts per million, just because that's the basic level. When you gas off more CO2, you're going to have to pump in more CO2 to keep it at that 30 parts per million. But the thing is, when you're pumping more CO2 into that same volume, it's creating more even distribution. So it's not just more stable, you're creating that stability with this flux. But why do you want that stability? The reason you want that stability is because you want even distribution of CO2 throughout the aquarium. When you have even distribution of CO2 throughout the aquarium, you're going to get healthier plant growth. This is the main point when people talk about, hey, have surface agitation, and when I mention the CO2 to oxygen flux and the gas exchange and what does this all mean? What is the point? The whole point is getting even distribution of CO2 within that volume. Having a higher flux, a higher you know CO2 escaping that area allows you to pump more CO2 into that area so it's the same size area with more CO2. It creates more even dis distribution for the plants making the plant growth that much healthier. That's why you want to get rid of that biofilm. That's why you want to have high oxygen to get rid of the biofilm. How do you get rid of the biofilm, wet dry filter, high agitation, surface skimmer? Now that it's gone, you want to have that surface agitation to have that higher flux. Why do you want that higher flux to have the stability? Why do you want that stability to have more even distribution of CO2 throughout the aquarium? This is exactly what people mean when they say it, so I hope that explains it. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't talk about. It's not mentioned often enough. I always ask the question, why? We just hear, just have surface agitation. Why? You can see that there's, you know, many underlying reasons as to why. So now let's get into how CO2 and light relate with one another um, and when it, basically how it correlates to plant growth. Okay, so I've had people asking me, hey, I want to have slow growing plants such as Bucephalandra and Anubius growing up high in my aquarium. It shows off great color with my Buses. I want to have, you know, my Brownie Ghost or Brownie Metallica showing off these amazing reds and everything. But the thing is, now that they're under that really bright light, you know, they, they tend to get algae, they tend to get green spot algae, you know, different kinds of algae. Um, so, you know, how can I have these plants under high light? Um, but without getting algae and also as well as having my plants below growing healthily. So my whole point in this when it comes to the CO2 and the light relationship and how it correlates to, to plant growth is this. CO2 and light work synergistically. So if you increase your CO2 um, it makes so the plants don't have to work as hard to get carbon. So now they can focus more on photosynthesizing so they can actually more efficiently utilize the available light okay and vice versa so how does this apply to the aquarium well let's put it this way 
Let's say you want you have shade-loving plants up top, they're getting a lot of algae, you need to tone down your light, right? This is about balancing light from top to bottom. It's about balancing light based on depth, and how you do this is by using CO2, so it basically the tool that you're using is the CO2. So let's say you're getting a bunch of algae on your buses, you need to turn your light down. Well, when you turn your light down, it affects you know the buses at the bottom it affects plants at the bottom now your bellum hair grass isn't growing as well now your anubius at the bottom isn't growing as well because it's not getting enough light maybe there's mosses up top or some plants up top that are shading the lights or shading the plants below and they're not getting enough light well what you can do is you can increase your co2 if you increase your co2 and we're already assuming that you have a good surface agitation stabilized co2 you don't have that biofilm right we're assuming that you already have optimize CO2 at this point. This is just one step you know, further that you can take to optimize your CO2 even more, which of course is going to optimize your plant growth. You know, This whole hobby is based on plant growth first and foremost. That's why I don't like a lot of those contests. AGA, Aquatic Experience, even ADA, I, IAPLC, I'm not going to get into it, but I've noticed a decline in plant health and you cannot say you're an aquascaper if you have shitty plant health. The first and foremost thing is plants, not the design. And even before plants is good water quality. You have to have good water quality. What does that mean? It means high oxygen, low organics, low biochemical oxygen demand. Then you have to have healthy plants. On my channel, that's what I teach you how to do. I pride myself in having some of the healthiest plants around besides Tropica. You can't say that you have a wonderful design and have shitty plants. So I digress. Back to what I was saying. How does this apply to the buses, the Anubias at the bottom? Okay, if you increase your CO2, it's going to allow those plants at the bottom to better utilize the light that's already there. It's that simple. That's a synergistic relationship between light and CO2. That's what people mean when they talk about the CO2 O2 flux and why you want to have higher surface agitation. This is optimizing your CO2. This is what people mean, the true meaning of optimizing your CO2. Until next time, keep your sleeves wet. Peace out.